Hi everyone, it's Michael from Chess Lifestyle, and for today's episode, uh, I wanted to discuss with you some chess psychology. Now, probably, you know, from my previous videos or the streams recently, you've had a lot of uh, random rants about uh, random chess topics, uh, but this is actually a topic that has been on my mind for quite a while, and I wanted to discuss it, and I'm not exactly sure where this video is going to go, um, but I wanted to really discuss the psychology behind losing a one position in chess. So a position where you have an advantage and then you lose the advantage and then you lose as a result. So as you can see in front of us, uh, we don't have a chessboard, but we have uh, a screen uh, showing uh, fantasy football. And for anyone who doesn't know what fantasy football is, basically uh, it's a competition uh, that's free to take part in. And uh, the idea is that uh, each week of the Premier League, so Premier League is uh, this uh, the, the main league in the UK for football. Um, and each week of the Premier League, you can basically select uh, 11 players with four substitutes. And uh, you're aiming to pick the players who you think will score the highest that week. And each week you can make one substitute. You also have a budget of 100 million. Uh, so you can't just pick all the, you know, the strongest, highest uh, priced players. So you need to have some kind of balance. Um... And yeah, the aim of the game is to score as many points as you can. Now, uh, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because I kind of experienced uh, something similar, at least in how I felt, to what it feels like to lose a one position in chess. So to give a little bit more uh, context, uh, basically last week, um, I scored 42 points, which is not very good and slightly below average even, which is pretty poor. <laughs> um, but... Uh, basically, I had this team in front of us here. So, you know, I selected these different players for various reasons. Um, and I want you to focus on this player in the middle here, uh, Phil Foden, right? Who's a player for Man City. And uh, in recent weeks, you know, I hadn't really been spending too much time on uh, fantasy football at all. I've just been quite busy. Um, but for this week, uh, so the, the one just gone, uh, I actually had... A decent amount of time. So I decided to do some research into who I should pick for this week. Now, um, I'll try and I'll try and explain it very briefly because I don't want this whole video to be <laughs> about this uh, really terrible, uh, unfortunate uh, mistake that I made. But basically, um, uh, I realized that I actually had the funds to upgrade this player Broja um, for the time at the time he was playing for Chelsea. Um, I could upgrade this uh, terrible player, Broja, who I had bought very cheap, and that's why I bought him. Um, I could upgrade him to a player called uh, Solanke, who uh, is playing for Bournemouth. And, of course, this would be a really great move. Um, but as a result, uh, I need to bench one of these players. Now, the way the points work is that the team of 11 get points, uh, and your four players on the bench do not score any points. Now, what ended up happening was, as you can see, remember I said focus on this Phil Foden player? Uh, I decided out of all of my front uh, six players um, to keep, I would bench Phil Foden and bring in Solanke. Now, what ended up happening was uh, I expected Solanke to score really well because he was playing a team called Nottingham Forest and uh, Nottingham Forest had conceded many, many goals in the past few weeks. And Solanke, last time playing Nottingham Forest, had scored a hat-trick, so scored three goals. And you get a lot of points for scoring goals, right? So uh, I made him a captain, which doubles his points. And long story short, basically, Solanke blanked. Uh, he scored, like, the bare minimum for just turning up. So I got double the points of him just turning up. If I'd captained any other player... Uh, who I would have captained in my front six, uh, I would have scored more points than captaining Solanke. And as you can see, the player who scored the most points this week out of my team was Phil Foden, who I benched. And as a result of benching, uh, I do not score any of these points. And 20 points in fantasy football is a huge, huge deal. So I literally lost out on winning 20 points uh, more, uh, and probably more than that, because I would have captained a different player. And it all would have happened if I hadn't uh, spent the time researching into who I should bring in and making a, like, I don't know, spending a few hours, like, really working hard on, like, finding the best team. And then luck should have it that actually it worked out in the opposite and, and, I, and I come out on worse. Now, um, 
the actual discussion of like how I came out, out on worse is not so important uh, to the discussion I want to get to today. But I want to describe a feeling, right? Like basically, I had a team that was going to be a winning team, right? And had I not done anything to it, it would have, you know, won me a lot of points. I'd probably be way more uh, ahead in, in this overall uh, points, right? Or my overall rank. Um, but as a result uh, of these changes, I then lost my winning team, right? Like I went from uh, a position where I felt like I had something to a position where I didn't have something and, uh, and I feel bad as a result, right? And I think like this kind of situation can even be boiled down to as simple as someone who has uh, a possession or an item that they value and they lose that item. Let's say we care so much about having these rocks and we lose the rocks. Then we'd feel bad as a result. Now, if we never had the rocks or never had this prized possession in the first place, then it wouldn't feel bad if we've lost it, right? We just never had it. So I actually think that this kind of mentality and this kind of effect that it has on you um, can be translated to chess in the sense that losing a one position feels a lot worse than losing a game where we didn't have a one position in the first place. So I hope you I hope you're still following uh, what I what I'm saying right now. And I wanted to give you some chess chess examples of this. So, for instance, um, I think actually in chess um, you can decide your openings based on this kind of philosophy in some way. And as you can see in this game, uh, up to move eight, uh, I've played I've played a Dutch. And uh, as you can see, the position is plus 0.9. So objectively speaking, a plus 0.9 is some significant advantage. And this means that, um, yeah, if the position continues objectively uh, with strongest moves from both sides, white should be able to establish a winning position. However, in reality, um, the Dutch has an extremely high turnaround rate and this turnaround rate I'm going to use a lot so what I really mean by turnaround rate is basically like turning a worse position into a winning position uh, or it could mean um, a winning position to a lost position but as you can see the, the position is better for white but after a few moves this was a classical game of mine uh, last year and I had a really tremendous game um, my opponent played e4, there's this rule that you want to meet e4 with e5, and already my opponent has gone slightly wrong. And this position, it almost feels like uh, it's it's close to collapse, because with the knight coming to d5, there's huge pressure on e5, there's huge pressure on c7, but somehow my activity just kind of works out, and I manage to turn around the position, um, and uh, I end up having a completely winning uh, attack. And this was uh, a beautiful game in the end. And uh, yeah, I was very proud of this uh, attacking attacking game that I, I pulled off. Um, and I won. Now, in contrast, uh, I had a game uh, in uh, the British Major Open where um, I got this position on the board. So you can see I've got full control of the center. This bishop is completely shut out of the game and I have a slight advantage. Now in this position, I was expecting my opponent to play c4 to try and open up the position as you would with, with having a bishop. But my opponent played the move queen c3, which I thought was horrendous because uh, as I wrote here, has the guy not heard of pawn breaks? Um, I played queen b6, um, queen b2 back, right? Just not really doing much. And then I decided to reroute my knight. Now, apparently this wasn't best, but given my opponent played so passively, he actually allowed me to establish this position and even get this move d4. So in this position, I felt that I had an advantage. I, I felt that my position was really strong, but I didn't know what to do with it. It kind of uh, started to collapse. And actually in this position, um, I ended up uh, missing a win. Like I was very close uh, to playing h4, but then I thought that uh, queen c7 was like a slight uh, improvement over the immediate h4, but then I overlooked that white had uh, a defensive resource against my h4, so I missed missed the chance to go for it. And then uh, I thought that playing e6, uh, at, uh, d3, sorry, uh, at, at this moment would um, 
lead to a position in my favor, but actually I've ended up uh, losing uh, this this better position. And um, uh, yeah, like I ended up uh, messing up this position and uh, I had some opportunities to come back, but basically the position uh, was um, a turnaround, right? Like I had this uh, stronger position from the opening and my opponent uh, without even doing much, managed to turn around the position, and this feels really bad, right? So, uh, yeah, I wanted to discuss this concept a bit further and suggest, uh, like, an opening that uh, we see this turnaround rate being very high is the Alakine, right? And actually, I should have uh, got this game open and had a look at it first, but I believe, like, uh, Wei Yi uh, beat Gukesh in some uh, Blitz playoff or Armageddon or something, and Wei Yi chose the Alakine as an opening. So objectively, it's it's not it's not good. But the turnaround rate to go from a lost position to a winning position is very high. And I wanted to show you something very interesting here, which is in this position, uh, this is like the main line of the Alakine. Uh, as you can see, Stockfish firmly believes that C4, uh, with the intention of playing F4, is objectively the best way to play this position. Uh, but um, if you see what masters are playing, we see in 66% of the games, white is actually choosing to play knight f3 instead of this aggressive four pawns attack. And even after c4, a lot of players, uh, you can see 75% are actually playing e takes d6, a suboptimal move compared to f4. So why is this? Why are these top players not playing uh, the most engine critical uh, line for an advantage? And the point is that in this kind of position, the four pawns attack, the turnaround rate is very high. So even though black is objectively worse, there are actually many ways that black can try uh, combat uh, this uh, very uh, uh, expanded center. And it means that very quickly, a position that might be even reaching like plus one, plus 1.5, plus two, uh, may suddenly collapse and suddenly be in the minus territory. So the strongest players recognize this, and that's why they play some kind of slower uh, move that, okay, gives up some of the advantage, but uh, doesn't allow for black to have as high of a turnaround rate. So I think this kind of consideration, like how much chance is there for an opening to turn around, uh, I think is a, is a really important factor when considering an opening um, for, for yourself, right? And I also wanted to show this game, uh, actually. Uh, and actually, no, I'll come to this game in a bit. So basically, uh, I wanted to summarize like this, this topic by, by saying that I think you should really look inside yourself to understand what kind of strengths you have as a player. And basically, some players can handle the pressure of holding on to an advantage and not losing it. So firstly, that's a skill in itself. Like, you know, if you have if you have the rock, you need to make sure that you don't lose the rock. So that's one aspect of the skill. But also the second aspect is if you lose the rock, you are like able to mentally endure that pain of losing that rock. If you are able to do both these things, then playing an objectively good opening from the start and keeping hold of this advantage is probably the best way for you to go. Because, you know, there are some perks of this as well, like you have this objective advantage, which is useful. Um, but for players who aren't so good at uh, dealing with the circumstances of losing uh, this rock, um, or maybe they're bad at even just keeping hold of the rock in the first place, then I think finding openings that have this high turnaround rate um, is better. Like, I think you're going to get better results uh, from that. And I think... Um, Regarding, regarding the players who I think, uh, you know, would be able to keep an advantage well, I do think that there are certain openings where it's easier uh, than others, right? So, for instance, I think, um, let's say if you get, like, some kind of uh, Queen's Gambit uh, type position and you get uh, this uh, exchange uh, variation where you get, like, uh, this kind of Carlsberg structure, um, you can practice this a lot, you have a slight advantage, and over time, uh, you'll um, uh, improve at this uh, 
technique of giving this minority attack. And um, yeah, you can try and convert this very slight uh, advantage. And also um, the risk of you letting your opponent turn into round is far less because you really understand the position well. So there are certain openings that I think you can uh, keep the advantage easier than others. And I think this should also be a factor too. Like if you're playing an opening where, I don't know, maybe let's say you're playing like the open Sicilian, but you don't really know the positions too well, you might have this slight advantage, but it can easily, easily um, become lost, the advantage. So uh, I think really consider carefully uh, like which of the two types of players are you? Are you better at turning around the position or are you better at keeping the advantage? And even if you are better at keeping the advantage, you then need to think very carefully about what advantage you want to keep. Um, like which, what type of positions will be easier to keep the advantage, right? And finally, uh, I wanted to share with you like a piece of advice that Michael Adams once said in an interview, where he said that he reckoned probably the most effective and practical approach to a white repertoire is basically picking lines that have an extremely high turnaround rate, but at worst, they are a draw. So they might be very sharp um, and black may need to navigate for many moves in order to realize uh, the draw. But uh, at many opportunities, um, white can suddenly turn around the position and win. So it's kind of like, um, yeah, high chances of a win and at worst a draw. And with the white pieces, you can get away with this, right? So one player that really did this effectively uh, was this Nicholas Teodoru, who's uh, this uh, young adult from Greek Greece. And actually, I got to play him, uh, which was a very cool game. And I actually, uh, actually outplayed him in his King's Indian, which is his famous uh, opening for black. And after the game, he said, you know, was this prepared specifically against me, this anti-King's Indian line? And I said, no, like, you know, I'd prepared this against other people and basically I'd come up with a line very similar to what we we're discussing actually where it wasn't objectively good but probably objectively at worst it was equal or maybe slightly better for black but it's very easy to go wrong and my opponent went wrong and now okay he's an absolute beast uh, with calculation and uh, he completely outplayed me after I established like a plus uh, 1.5 plus 2 advantage and I lost. Um, but from an opening perspective, it worked very well. And actually this game, he did exactly this kind of advice that Michael Adams did. And, and I want to say that, okay, uh, he was playing Rajabov, who's you know one of the top players in the world, and Rajabov played a Petrov. Now, if White was trying to just play for this objective advantage and keep this advantage, uh, White would play takes, uh, Black would play d6, White would go back, Black would take on e4, White played d4, Black would play d5. This is a very well-known position where White has a very slight advantage, but it's very, very difficult to actually convert this position and actually turn this advantage into a win. Like, even though white is slightly better, they're probably just going to be slightly better the whole game and it's very difficult to win. Whereas, uh, what um, Nicolas played was he played this gambit line of d4 and he chose a system where he sacked on f7 and this position is actually just a draw. With best play, this position is drawn. But, of course, objectively speaking, this is not so easy sorry, not objectively speaking, practically speaking, this is not so easy uh, to get the draw. And in fact, Rajabov was handling this position very well. This was all correct. Uh, even though it was out of book by now, I think uh, Rajabov knew uh, what well, was, was defending very accurately. And this position was still objectively drawn until rookie six. And because Nicholas had studied this position very well in depth, he knew that 96 was a blunder and his whole game was complete prep. Like, this whole attack, he knew exactly how to exploit the rookie six, and in the end, uh, Rajalbov resigned in a lost position um, as a result of Nicholas's play. So as you can see, you know, Nicholas did not choose the most objective route to victory based on whatever, you know, the engine says is objectively best, but he's really thinking practically as to what is going to be his best chances and where do his strengths lie as a player. So... I think when it comes to like deciding an opening, um, I think this kind of turnaround rate is definitely overlooked by many uh, beginner or intermediate players uh, because they're simply just looking at Stockfish and saying, oh, okay, this has a bad eval, I shouldn't play this, right? But you've got to look beyond that and you've got to understand that, yeah, like the actual chance of success um, needs to be brought into the equation, not just... 
uh, from an objective standpoint, but but from a practical standpoint as well. So I think like if you realize these aspects uh, as a player, uh, then you can really use this to your advantage to play in the way that suits you best. And I think uh, to tie this in with what I was saying at the start, because you might think, okay, how is this linked to, you know, the fantasy football thing I said at the start? But I think, like, the the discomfort and uh, sadness I felt from having had Foden in the team and then benching Foden as a result of my incompetence, um, I think this is a similar feeling to getting a better position that uh, you know is better and you know your opponent has played some garbage moves, and then managing to mess it up, this takes a real mental toll on me. And I think that mental toll actually then affects my form, affects my mood, affects my ability to play subsequent games. And I don't think this mood is necessarily so um, unnatural. Like, I think a lot of people would also feel the same kind of uh, sadness from losing something that they had, right? Losing this prized possession that you had and then you lost. So I think it's a natural human reaction. And I think perhaps rather than try and, you know, learn to be a robot and not, you know, let these feelings like actually affect you as much as they do, it's perhaps better to just try and avoid the situation altogether. Now, in one hand, you can say that, okay, I will just make sure I convert every position perfectly and never mess up. But okay, the problem is, yeah, if it's not your style to always be able to convert cleanly and objectively, then perhaps an opening with a higher turnaround is perhaps the better practical choice and the best option to lead to more success in your games. So I think it's something I'm going to have to think about as well, because I think there are certain aspects of my repertoire right now that... uh, Perhaps in the past, I had like more opportunity to have this turnaround. And um, I need to think very carefully about like what impact, um, well, what kind of player I am. Like, am I better with these kind of turnaround positions? Um, or am I better off playing some kind of like uh, Carlsberg setup where, okay, this is like more safe. I am just uh, converting the position and there's less chance of a turnaround happening, right? So maybe being this kind of player that converts, that uh, doesn't allow my opponent to turn around. This could be maybe like my, my, my optimal style. So I think, I think these considerations are very important. Um, I don't think it's really been touched upon much in, in terms of like how you pick openings and also just how you, how you play, how you play chess. So I think, yeah, I'd be very interested to hear like, um, you know, if you guys have any thoughts about your own repertoire and your own style and, yeah, whether you think that perhaps you are better off in a different uh, style and and choosing a different opening to maximize uh, this aspect uh, of your style. Uh, So yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Uh, I hope some of that was coherent. I have no idea if uh, any of that was coherent, but um, yeah, found find it quite an interesting topic. And maybe uh, for a few of you, it might be quite useful in terms of how to uh, improve improve your game. Uh, so yeah, that's all from me. Uh, finally, I'd like to shout out my Patreon subscribers and also any of the new YouTube members uh, to my streams. Very, very much appreciated for all of the support. And yeah, I will be streaming later today. So if you watch this video and you want to catch more of me, uh, stay tuned for some streams. Okay, until then, see you in the next video. Bye.